meta-argument, is a term that's been used to describe a variety of related ideas. Strictly, it means arguments about arguments, but I'll use it more broadly to mean arguments about anything other than the historical data we have and their interpretation. The argument from authority is the best-known meta-argument. It's about the opinions of contemporary scholars, and its methods are opinion surveys, quite unlike arguments, which are about the interpretation of evidence left to us from the past. The argument from authority is a manifest argument, in that it's often openly appealed to in public debate, but most meta-arguments are occult. Nobody wants to admit that they are influenced by them. They are never appealed to in public other than as personal attacks on opponents. It does, though, appear that they are among the most persuasive arguments, as they seem to fairly reliably correlate with what people believe. So, for example, arguments from secondary gain. This is when somebody believes something because to do so benefits them in some way that's not directly related to what they believe. Maybe they're being paid to believe it. On the other hand, an argument from primary gain will be something like believing fire is hot and burns you. Believing that will directly protect you from injury and so give you a primary benefit. A secondary gain is when there is some additional man-made or social reason to believe in something like peer pressure, career prospects, being paid to hold some belief, or being selected for employment because you hold some belief. As an aside, the idea of peer pressure does not really capture the social truth of meta-arguments. Their implicit nature leads them to be heavily loaded with emotion, far more so than rational arguments ever can be, and these emotions can be strong enough to lead people to kill and be killed. Worth bearing in mind when you hear arguments like early Christians would not have gone to their deaths because of a fairy story. And we see the deadly consequences of the intense negative emotions associated with meta-arguments play out around the world in both politics and religion. Anyway, another meta-argument is what you're taught in education as a young person. A variant on the argument from authority but acting vertically rather than horizontally. These terms are borrowed from epidemiology where horizontal disease spread is passed from person to person like coronavirus and vertical spread is passed down time from generation to generation like some genetic disorders. Vertical belief transmission in this way is related to the way beliefs are formed and held at different ages of life. Beliefs are formed by weighing their evidence, benefits and drawbacks and reaching a belief that will be held long term. But that process of assessing the evidence, benefits and drawbacks will be rarely, if ever, revisited. When we're young, we tend to be more gullible or impressionable, if you prefer, and more easily persuaded by adults. Then, we grow in wisdom and stature, but primarily in wisdom. In maturity, we may not be persuaded by the arguments that led us to the beliefs we adopted in childhood. However, because we never revisited that process, we continue to maintain those beliefs. In other debates, such as whether or not God exists, other meta-arguments like the argument from utility are used. That's the argument that runs, society tends to function better if people believe in God, and therefore we should believe in God. A surrogate version of that argument does occasionally appear in the mythicist versus historist debate, with specifically triumphal historicists and mythicists dismissing each other on the grounds that they must have defective morality because they either do or do not believe in God. Most meta-arguments are related to the personal circumstances of individuals. They are often seen as weak arguments or ulterior motives, and so they are most often developed by minority groups seeking to challenge the consensus. That means that in the current debate they are most often cited and attacked by the mythicist side, but actually both sides of the debate are equally affected by them. There are various things to note about these meta-arguments. Firstly, they are not subject-specific, because they are not about the evidence and the arguments within a specific discipline, but rather about human psychology and the behaviour of groups, and these to some extent apply across all academic disciplines. But perhaps the historicity of Jesus is one of the best substrate subjects to study them because of two features. One is the presence of intensely held religious views, and the other is that sparse, ambiguous evidence does not allow for conclusive arguments, leaving plenty of room for meta-arguments to influence opinions. Another distinction between arguments and meta-arguments is durability. Arguments don't last forever, because the evidence base in disciplines does change, but the rate of change of the evidence base in ancient history is fairly slow.
It changes with the progress of archaeological digs, and occasionally significant caches of manuscripts show up, such as the Cairo Geniza in the late 19th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Nag Hammadi Library in the mid-20th century, and smaller finds such as the Gospel of Judas around the turn of the 21st century. And no doubt further such finds will occasionally be made in the coming years. Furthermore, technological advances are likely to make it increasingly feasible to read seriously damaged documents that are already known of. And there are many key texts such as the Sinai Codex that may eventually be subject to radiochemical dating. All of these advances have been highly significant, but only in fairly circumscribed areas. So the Dead Sea Scrolls informed us about Judaism at the turn of the first millennium. The Nag Hammadi Library told us about Gnosticism in the early first millennium, but none of them have delivered a knockout punch in the historicity versus mythicism debate. So, the evidence changes slowly, and once an argument is devised, it remains durable, though its traction and perceived importance changes, things that are heavily influenced by meta-arguments. So, arguments have a long life. Meta-arguments, on the other hand, have a relatively short life typically the duration of scholarly careers. Scholars tend to reach their conclusions early in their careers and then spend the rest of their careers trying to prove them. Rarely do they change their position as seniors, but new generations of scholars weigh the evidence and arguments they find and make up their conclusions, often with some bias against what is established, and go through the same cycle again. If the meta-arguments change in favour of mythicism, then it's very likely that the scholarly consensus will also change. This has happened before. Mythicism was prominent amongst Soviet scholars. Their skill, aptitude and dedication was no less than that of other groups. But they were working in an environment where meta-arguments favoured an anti-Christian position. Mythicism is seen, incorrectly I think, as an anti-Christian position, and the meta-arguments for it are dominated by the desire to attack Christianity. Many mythicists assume that position because they are anti-Christian atheists rather than because the evidence drives them towards it. Then the arguments for and against mythicism they see as a menu from which they pick out the ones they like in order to advance a hypothesis that is actually motivated by meta-arguments. You may recall that the renowned atheist Richard Dawkins rather foolishly dabbled in mythicism before backtracking in the face of scholarly opposition. And he did so for exactly this reason. Also, a lot of prominent mythicists started out as Christians and have got to mythicism as the last station on the railway away from fundamentalist Christianity. Perhaps that's rather an artificial spectrum, though, because in this field of the underlying motivation behind ideas and beliefs, love and hatred are much closer to each other than either is to apathy. A disinterested inquiry is the one that's most likely to reach the truth, but those who are disinterested do not have the motivation to pursue a subject and write books and articles about it. Of course, participants in debates like this will have you know that it's only the opposing side that is unduly influenced by meta-arguments, not their side. But we all know that's nonsense. Both sides are influenced by meta-arguments probably in a pretty much equal measure. In this case, they probably are more articulated more about the historicist side than they are about the mythicist, because the one manifest meta-argument, the argument from authority, is in favour of historicity, and therefore it's the mythicist attack dogs that are out rather than the historicists. But that's purely due to current circumstances, rather than anything intrinsic about the people or arguments on either side. So what of the future? This is a debate that's more dependent than most on meta-arguments, and meta-arguments are not durable, and change as generation of scholars come and go, while arguments themselves remain fairly constant. My assessment is at the moment, the arguments are fairly inconclusive about the historicity of Jesus, and out with meta-arguments, the likelihood of Jesus' existence lies somewhere between the view of the prominent mythicist scholar Robert Price, which is that on the balance of probability, He probably didn't exist, but that's about as far as the evidence allows you to go. And on the other hand, Tovia Singer is a rabbi working on Jewish outreach and countering Christian proselytisation in his own religion. He has a detailed knowledge of the New Testament and estimates the likelihood of Jesus' existence to be about 80%. The current scholarly consensus is way outside that range on the historicist side. And I expect to see this change over the coming decades, so that mythicism gains ground to become a larger and more acceptable minority than it is at the moment. The Church will continue to have a large influence over New Testament scholarship, but mythicism is not an anti-Christian position. 
Already, the progressive wing of the church sees the Bible not primarily as history, but as a series of early steps in the long-term and ongoing project of humans to perceive the nature and will of the divine. Mythicism does not turn that project into a train wreck. It may indeed allow a deeper and less divisive insight into the origins of Christianity than does historicity. I think it's possible that progressive elements in the church will come to this view, and if they do, it would open up the debate substantially. On the other hand, on plain reading, the New Testament is thoroughly historicist, with the exception of Paul, and plain reading is the preferred method of scholarship. The reasons for that are explored in my video on why scholars are historicist, and those reasons are not related to meta-arguments and they are not going to change. Therefore, I think the likely future is that mythicism will become a respectable position that will attract a growing minority of scholars, but it will probably remain a minority view for the foreseeable future. So how should meta-arguments be used? Broadly, I think they should be avoided. They largely have an emotional, implicit nature. The only mind you are likely to change by considering meta-arguments is your own. Language is a tool for the communication of rationality. Using it to communicate emotional issues takes great skill, and using it without that skill provokes resentment and defence, and is best reserved for preaching to the choir. When somebody changes a position they hold that was based on meta-arguments, it is a slow and introspective process. And the external influences on that process are arguments, not meta-arguments, as can be seen by reading authors who recount their journey either into or out of faith. As Jesus said in Mark 4, 26-29, The kingdom of God is like someone who spreads seed on the ground. He goes to sleep and gets up night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. By itself the soil produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And when the grain is ripe, he sends in the sickle, because the harvest has come.